good evening. Welcome to the Canadian Embassy. Bienvenue à l'Ambassade du Canada. Thank you very much for joining us. My name is David Nelson. I'm the counselor here at the Embassy. And none of you can hear me. That might be that actually that actually might be a good thing. Some some people would say. Um, Bienvenue à l'Ambassade du Canada. Thank you for joining us. Um, and I would like, without further ado, to introduce our Deputy Head of Mission, Sarah Cohen, who will make some introductory remarks. Thank you. David, thank you so much. And thank you to all of you tonight for joining us both here in person at the Embassy of Canada to the United States of America, and those of you who've tuned in online. It's my distinct privilege to be able to welcome you to the 20th annual Seymour Martin Lipset Lecture on Democracy in the World. We are as always very pleased to partner with the Public for Democracy, and I also would really very much like to thank the hardworking embassy staff who've been able to put this event together for us tonight. This is a really fantastic annual event. The embassy is delighted to act as host every year. The Seymour Martin Lipset Lecture on Democracy in the World was inaugurated in 2004 by the Endowment and the Monk School of Global Affairs of the University of Toronto as a forum for discourse and democracy and its progress worldwide. The lecture is named, as you all know, for one of the great democratic scholars and public intellectuals of the 20th century. Professor Lipset was also one of the most important comparative analysts of the two great democracies in North America and a strong advocate for US Canada cooperation. We here at the embassy certainly endorse this part of his legacy and his message to us, particularly at a time when Increasingly, we reflect upon the great privilege it is to work on a U.S. Canada relationship, a relationship with leaders who don't have to find fear in each other, but rather can work together collaboratively in a world where many, many, many countries do not have the privilege or the luxury to say these things. The Lipset Lecture has been a number of fascinating and distinguished speakers over the last 20 years. And of course, this year is no exception. This year's lecture will be delivered by Professor Larry Diamond, Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution, Stanford University, and founding co-editor, Journal of Democracy, on power, performance, and legitimacy, renewing global democratic momentum. I am told he will be giving us reason for optimism and perhaps some hope, which is something that I don't always get to say at events profiling foreign policy and national security. In addition to Professor Diamond, we are very pleased to host Svetlana, Svetlana Tikhanouskaya, leader of Democratic Belarus. Thank you for being here. It's an honor to host you. Uh, it is an honor to host you this evening, and we are looking forward to your conversation with Professor Diamond following your, the lecture. Your efforts to drive a democratic transition in Belarus during and since the August 2020 sham election have been an inspiration. Canada is proud to stand in solidarity with you and your husband, who remains wrongfully imprisoned in Belarus. We're strong supporters of the democratic aspirations of the Belarusian people. The situation on the ground remains severe. Human rights violations by the regime have increased in Belarus since the 2020 election. election. Bogus detentions, widespread torture, and sexual and gender-based violence continue. And so this is why Canada has applied a broad and diverse set of economic and diplomatic sanctions on Belarus. We also continue to hold the regime to account for its violations through the UN system and the International Accountability Platform for Belarus. And of course, and to the point I made earlier, Canada does all of this alongside the US government. The world's leading democracies must support others struggling to maintain their systems and those people seeking to establish democratic governance for themselves. But tonight isn't only about global stock taking. It's about recognizing each other, our friends and colleagues working hard in this space. It's also, hopefully, an opportunity for some calibrated optimism regarding the strength and resilience of democratic institutions. I give that task to Professor Diamond. To all of you, thank you again for joining us for the lecture. Uh, and for those of you here in person for the reception to follow. It's now my pleasure to hand over the podium to Damon Wilson, President and CEO of the National Endowment of Democracy. Damon, over to you. Thank you much, so much, Sarah, <clears throat> for that wonderful welcome to everyone who's here tonight. And I wanna welcome everyone who's here in person, but also all of us uh, who are online. 
Um, we've been doing the Lipset Lecture for 20 years, and this one created a bit of a demand. And so uh, uh, I do want to welcome everyone who, had, who wasn't able to join in person but is online. Um, the Embassy of Canada has been such a wonderful partner for this, this lecture series from the beginning. So thanks to the team here that made this evening possible. I also want to recognize we have with us um, tonight some of our leadership at the endowment. Our chairman, Ken Wallach, is joining. I think we have our former chairman, Martin Frost, as well. As vice, Martin Frost, yes, our vice chair. Thank you. Our vice chair, uh, Peter Roskam, is with us as well. Ambassador Kelly Curry, Mark Platner, uh, and Bill Galston. Um, so thank you for the NED leadership for being here with us tonight. And of course, our founding president, Carl Gershman, is also with us. Um, and the surprise arrival of a board member, a former board member I didn't know was coming, Eileen Donahoe. So we're really delighted to have you here too. Um, I'm, I'm really pleased that we're doing tonight's lecture with so many people in this room who are at the heart of defending democracy around the world. For you, these aren't just abstract ideas. But I'm also really pleased that we're doing this in the presence of, of leaders on the front line of the struggle. Svetlana Sikhanovskaya, who you heard, is with us, the national leader uh, and head of the United Transitional Cabinet of Belarus. We're also joined by President Elbig Dorj. Mr. President, thank you from Mongolia uh, for being with us. Sarah said, since 2004, um, the Endowments International Forum for Democratic Studies, the Monk School for Global Affairs at the University of Toronto, and the Embassy of Canada have worked in partnership to organize the Seymour Martin Lipset Lecture on Democracy in the World, which has established itself as one of the most important for most important for, for discussions on democracy. And the lecture, of course, is named for one of the great democracy scholars and public intellectuals of the 20th century, Seymour Martin Lipset. His scholarship on such themes as political parties, ideologies, voting, behavior, and public opinion, this body of work constitutes one of the most prolific and widely read bodies of work on democracy ever produced by a single author. And our hosting of this series underscores the endowment's commitment to serving as a hub for democratic activity, resources, and intellectual exchange for activists, practitioners, and scholars of democracy over the, around the world. It underscores our commitment to engaging in the battle of ideas. And I really want to thank those without whom the Lipset Lecture wouldn't be possible. Of course, the Canadian Embassy, the Johns Hopkins University Press, and the Sharp School of Policy and Government at George Mason University. I also want to give a shout out to the International Forum staff, Melissa Aiton, Abigail Scala, who especially for their hard work to put this together. And this year, we are so pleased to continue the proud Lipset Lecture tradition of distinguished speakers addressing the defining issues for the condition of democracy. And on this 20th anniversary event, during the 40th anniversary of the endowment, there is no one more appropriate to deliver this lecture than Larry Diamond. Not only because Larry, like Seymour Martin Lipset, is one of the great democracy scholars and public intellectuals of the century, but also because Larry was Marty Lipset's mentee. It's personal, it's beautiful, it's about relationships. Larry will deliver the lecture that's titled Power, Performance and Legitimacy, Renewing Global Democratic Momentum. And for us at the endowment, this is not just a lecture. We're not just here for ideas. This is about strategy. This is about our daily work. This is about the community that we have here working in common cause to try to bring the re reality of democratic momentum. And at a time when democracy is under attack, we ask ourselves, how do we learn? How do we adapt? How do we innovate so that we can play our part in democratic renewal? And how do we, many of you in this room, work together towards this end? And that's the reason Larry is perfect for this lecture, because beyond his great intellectual chops, his relationship with Marty Lipset, it's that Larry understands this work, support for democracy, it's about people. It's creative, courageous, determined, principled people who are at the forefront of this struggle for freedom, democracy, and justice around the world. And like those people who, many of whom are NED partners and many of whom we have here tonight. And it's something that I've learned in my two years as president of the endowment, that so many of these individuals have found inspiration guidance and support from Larry. They have been touched by Larry. 
I told him uh, yesterday that it's probably every other day I get an uh, email from someone from around the world who re refers to having been a student of Larry, having been referred by Larry, having been a Fisher Fellow colleague with Larry. And it's just remarkable the number of people that he has touched. So connect, to connect tonight's lecture to the challenges of the real world, we are honored that following the talk, Larry will be joined by Svetlana Sikhanovskaya in a conversation moderated by Chris Walker, the Vice President for Studies and Analysis at, at the Endowment. Finally, I want to acknowledge Sydney Lipset, who is also with us tonight. It's really an honor to have you with us. We would not have such a wonderful achievement in this lecture series without the steadfast and remarkable support of Sydney Lipset, who is a treasured member of the Ned family. She provides invaluable support to this lecture every year. She provides a, a moral, personal connection to it, and it's been my great honor to get to know you throughout this. So thank you. And with that, I'm going to invite Chris to give a formal introduction for Larry, and we'll get the show underway. Larry Diamond, he's of course a and we're recognizing at this prestigious lip in his role as a uh, make sure I have that. But Larry is much more than his scholarly He's edited many of the were done with Mark, with whom Larry had partnership during their time as co Stunning. Carl Gershman, better naturally to pull Larry into the to make that magic pop. Larry incredibly versatile on deep and extensive work on so many subjects, so many countries, including those like Burma, Taiwan, Nigeria, among many others. Larry's achievement on any single one of those would be impressive for a single scholar. He's done that and much more. Larry is much more than a scholar, as I noted. He's an extraordinary teacher and educator. Larry has leveraged his formidable scholarship to reach millions of people and students around the world. His massive online open courses have been viewed by many thousands of students far and wide. As part of his role as a public intellectual, Larry has also enriched the public discourse by authoring innumerable articles in the popular press, speaking publicly uh, in his unique and crystal clear voice, helping vast audiences understand often deeply complex democracy-related issues. Larry has a superb organizational sense. Apart from the multitude of hats he's worn at Stanford University, Larry's been deeply engaged organizationally, both informally and formally, with countless democracy organizations, including, of course, Ned, all of which benefit from his wisdom, integrity, and energy. Larry's shrewd analytical talents have infused a, mul a multitude of organizations and important initiatives. 
For instance, Larry has been pivotal to the work of the Afrobarometer and the Asian Barometer, which have been so important over time, understanding democracy evolutions in these regions at a strategic level. Larry tackles the big issues. These have included those as diverse as emerging technologies impact on political life, democracy in Africa, democracy in Asia, and China's global challenge to democracy, and many, many more. One important such example of his leadership as a catalyst and driver of change on an emerging big issue was the initiative undertaken by the Hoover Institution and the Asia Society that culminated in the 2018 report, China's Influence in American Interest. This effort, which pulled together an incredibly diverse range of China scholars from just about every conceivable corner of the political spectrum was truly critical for changing the public understanding and driving change on this issue. Larry's role in this was pivotal. I've only scratched the surface of Larry's enormous contributions. And as you can tell, Larry stays pretty active. And I'd like to conclude by mentioning something especially important in the role that Larry plays in our community. Larry possesses an exceptional nose for talent. Like a major league baseball scout who travels from diamond to diamond looking for uh, talent, uh, Larry has a nose for looking for the best possible talent out there. In this case, it's not for a shortstop with a strong throwing arm, but it's for democracy talent who can help strengthen our community. On this, Larry will often say something along the lines of, hey, have you ever heard of this person who's doing incredible work on emerging tech issues or on democratic resilience? And invariably, his suggestions and recommendations are impeccable with his recommendations. And so over the years, Larry's identified, encouraged, and helped quite literally hundreds and hundreds of people who have in turn been enlisted to take on fellowships, write for the Journal of Democracy or other prestigious publications, or otherwise make their way into the democracy field. I've seen Larry doing this myself, uh, do this on so many occasions, and I know that I've only seen a small number of his engagement on this front. He's helped literally thousands of people on, this, uh, on their journey for engagement in the democracy sphere. And it speaks to Larry's commitment and generosity. Larry is generous with his time and ideas and support. This is perhaps, I'm sorry, most impressive in his interactions with uh, younger people who are early in their career, activists and colleagues who are still making their way up. Larry is a mentor extraordinaire. He makes a special point of helping those who are still making their way up the career ladder. And he does this often quietly, and it's possible to take these sorts of things for granted. Everyone here who knows Larry knows just how true this is. And so I think you understand Larry is a very special person. He's a force of nature and a good and generous person in the truest sense of these words. His contributions to the cause have been and continue to be exceptional. And so I feel so privileged, especially in such challenging times for democracy, to welcome Larry Diamond, a lion of the field, a mentor and friend to so many, to deliver the 2023 Lipset Lecture on Democracy in the World. Larry. Thank you so much. One of the most humbling introductions I've ever received. It means all the more to be doing so while I'm literally staring at a photograph of my teacher and mentor, Seymour Martin Lipset, who, as Carl Wells know, was the man who introduced me to Carl Gershman and the National Endowment for Democracy. And I must say, Chris, uh, I know this will not be universally understood in this room, but I will say, in the service of one of my loyalties, I actually am seeking a power-hitting shortstop with a good throwing arm. Um, I do want to thank the National Endowment for Democracy for inviting me to deliver this annual lecture in honor, as I've said, of my teacher and mentor, Seymour Martin Lipset, 
Ned has been, I really want to underscore this, I think everyone in this room understands, a vital institution for defending and advancing democracy around the world. And its work has never been more important. <clears throat> and I'm going to say it one more time, thank you, Sidney Lipset, for being such a powerful and loving force in creating and sustaining this event. How can we renew momentum for democracy in the world? I believe there are three keys to doing so. It's not going to surprise you at this point. Power, performance, and legitimacy. The latter, the belief, as Marty Lipset often put it, that the political system in place in the country is morally right and proper, the best form of government. I'll consider each of these factors, but first, I want to address the state of democracy in the world. I've argued for some time, as many of you know, that the world entered a democratic recession around 2007, and that this recession has been deepening over time. This assessment is shared by people and organizations working on the ground to achieve, defend, and improve democracy. But it is surprisingly quite contested among scholars including those who publish in the Journal of Democracy. So first, briefly, the evidence. I assess democracy in two ways, categorically as either present or absent, and then continuously on a scale from zero to 100 that averages the three principal democracy scales, which I'll be referring to repeatedly, the Freedom House Combined Scale of Political Rights and Civil Liberties, which of course we all know, <clears throat> the Economist Democracy Index, and the Varieties of Democracy Index of Liberal Democracy. So to track trends in the world, I average these three measures. I'm going to refer back to this average. Think of it as a poll of polls. To assess whether a country is a democracy or not, I ask a very simple and important question. Can the people choose and replace their leaders in free and fair elections? Elections are free when diverse parties and candidates can contest and campaign, when people and groups can criticize incumbents and organize for their candidates, and when there is a secret ballot and low political violence. Elections are fair when they are administered by uh, impartial officials and courts, when there's a reasonably level playing field to access the media and other resources, and when there is um, universal adult suffrage, of course, and crucially, independent and honest counting of the vote and monitoring the vote. In many countries, these conditions coexist with uneven protection for civil liberties, extensive corruption, and a weak rule of law. The retreat from democracy has mainly been among those illiberal democracies. So to distinguish liberal democracy, I rely on the Freedom House scales. I count those that have one of the two best scores, a one or a two out of seven, on both the scale of political rights and the scale of civil liberties on the Freedom House scales. The judgment as to whether a country is an electoral democracy can be difficult and contested. Hungary is the country most often misclassified as a democracy, with the effect of, even unintentionally, legitimizing what Viktor Orban proudly proclaims to be a model of illiberal democracy. Orban's big win in his 2022 re-election bid may seem to validate that claim. But the test of democracy is not whether a regime holds political prisoners and imposes a pervasive climate of fear. It is whether people can choose and replace their leaders in free and fair elections. Orban and his Fidesz ruling party have taken nearly total control of the mass media while grotesquely gerrymandering electoral districts and intensely politicizing and dominating the civil service, the judiciary, and other regulatory bodies. This is not an illiberal democracy. It is a very clever autocracy. Now for the evidence. 
On the positive side is what Levitsky and Way in the Journal of Democracy have termed recently democracy's surprising resilience. Most liberal democracies have been resilient in this past decade and a half. From a peak of 34% in 2006, uh, the proportion of states over 1 million population that are liberal democracies has only declined by four percentage points. With the exception of Hungary, all EU member states and most other advanced industrial countries remain not just democracies, but liberal democracies. Brazil had a close call with democratic disruption in the weeks following the October 2022 uh, presidential election when the defeated incumbent Jair Bolsonaro was questioning the outcome and canvassing for a possible effort to circumvent it. But I'll come back to this. He was forced to concede defeat and leave office. In Argentina, out of control inflation has pushed 40% of the population into poverty. But the debate in the recent presidential election was about two radically different policy visions and the performance of the previous government, not, at least not so far, about whether to retain democracy. In Chile, a years-long process of much-needed constitutional reform went down to a crushing defeat in 2022. But uh, many, including the authors of the Journal of Democracy article, saw it as a victory for liberal democracy in that voters justifiably opposed constitutionalizing a vague and bewildering array of environmental, social, and identity rights. Among the liberal democracies, partisan and ideological polarization is often worrisomely high. And in a trend that would particularly worry Marty Lipset, political uh, tolerance and trust have seriously eroded. But many third wave democracies still seem robust. Many reversals or degradations of democracy have been temporary. And emerging uh, autocracies, as I will also come back to, have their own formidable obstacles to consolidation. Moreover, democratic backsliding is not irreversible. Democratic oppositions mounted vigorous electoral challenges in Hungary and Turkey. I think they got very close in Turkey. And this past October, with massive electoral mobilization, a positive policy agenda, and a massive voter turnout by youth, the democratic opposition in Poland showed, as Anna Applebaum wrote, that autocratic populism can be defeated even after an unfair election. As elections elsewhere have also shown, pro-democracy forces must unite, I hope this point will be remembered, behind a common positive agenda that addresses voters' bread and butter concerns, demonstrates the corruption and performance failures of the incumbents, and transcends populist polarization with broad appeals to a democratic, civic, nationalism. Unfortunately, however, many efforts to subvert democracy have not been contained, and thus we remain in a protracted democratic recession. Again, among countries with populations over one million, the percentage of states that are democracies has declined since 2006 from a peak of 57% to well under 50%, and by my own estimate, as low as 43%. The rate of democratic breakdown has been rising in every decade, from 8% in the 1980s to 19% in the last decade, ending last year. And the rate of transition to democracy has been steadily falling over the last decades, from a peak of 36% in the 1980s to 12% in the decade ending last year. Among the bigger and more consequential countries, virtually all mobilizations for democracy, sadly so far, but we do not consider it the final verdict in Belarus, have so far failed in this century. Since 2000, the only high profile mass movements for democracy that succeeded in bringing about a democratic transition and were in Ukraine following the Orange Revolution, and of course it's now under 
merciless assault by Russia, and Tunisia following the 2010-11 uprising, and it's been overturned in an executive coup. And as you're all no doubt aware, Freedom House data continues to show a steady pattern since 2007 of many more countries declining than gaining in freedom. The most troubling case of democratic regression has been in the world's most populous democracy, India. Under Prime Minister Narendra Modi and his ruling BJP, India's long record of political pluralism, freedom of expression, judicial independence, and religious tolerance has been imploding. The authoritarian project has progressed to the point where, to quote Maya Tudor in the Journal of Democracy, incumbent turnover remains electorally possible but improbable because the Modi government has substantially eroded the de facto protection of civil liberties and executive constraints. Fear now stalks the terrain of mass media reporting and academic, intellectual, social media, and even artistic expression in India. Due to widespread harassment of independent journalists and concentrating ownership structures, self-censorship is now the norm. Weaponizing the instruments of law enforcement, investigation, and persecution, the BJP has engaged in unprecedented efforts to intimidate and punish political opponents. And under the party's Hindu nationalist or Hindutva ideology, its formal and discriminatory laws, and the blatant inflammatory religious bigotry of many of its high-profile politicians, India's Muslim population, the third largest in the world, has been subjected to a rising tide of killings, lynchings, and other violence by hateful mobs. These assaults on democracy and human rights are all the more ominous, Sumit Ganguly argues, precisely because they do not constitute a formal and temporary emergency again, but rather an ambition to permanently transform India's political system. It is now fashionable to declare that claims of dem democratic backsliding reflect a recency bias that elides a prior history of authoritarian abuses. Yes, many of these backsliding democracies were of low quality, but the countries that have slid to the brink of democratic failure or beyond were all at one time genuine competitive democracies, including Turkey, Thailand, Venezuela, Benin, and El Salvador, which are all now autocracies, and India, the Philippines, Mexico, and South Africa, which have at least greatly deteriorated, and many of us question whether we can even call India still a democracy. To assess the global trends between 2006 and 2022, we can take this average 100-point scale of democracy and ask how many de countries uh, have declined by at least five points from their peak score between 2006 and 2022, and how many have improved by at least five points. And that's what I do, uh, cheated here by handing out a table in this handout, which you might have gotten a copy of, and I hope you mainly will uh, to get now or when you leave the personal reflection I offer of my mentor, Seymour Martin Lipson. If you do have that table and you look at it, you will see that um, if we look at states over 1 million and particularly look at the 45 big states with populations over 50 million or economies over 500 billion, what you see is the following. Of the 20 really weighty states, the big states, that experience significant change, 18 of the 20 declined during this period by at least five points. And 11 of those were democracies in 2006 such as Brazil, India, Indonesia, Mexico, South Africa, Turkey, and I think we should all worry, the United States. Just two big countries by those standards notably improved in this period, Colombia and Taiwan. And Taiwan, of course, became one of the most liberal democracies of the third wave. Of the eight authoritarian regimes that were weighty by population or economy size, all of them became more repressive, including Russia, China, and Iran. 
we can't look at these numbers and the relative country weight behind these numbers and the qualitative trends of political polarization, illiberal populism, and closing slivers of space in the world's autocracies and not conclude that we are still in the grip of a potent and protracted democratic recession and that we must develop a strategy to reverse it. This is not quite yet a third reverse wave, but with the growing challenges to the legitimacy of democracy, the feckless performance of many democracies, and the dramatic shifts in the global balance of power, the possibility of a much more disastrous retreat of freedom cannot be dismissed. So let's begin with Marty Lipset's favorite subject, legitimacy. There is still a broad aspiration for democracy around the world. And this belief in democracy remains um, quite widespread, uh, sufficient to support the claim by Amartya Sen and others that democracy is a universal value in the sense that people from vastly different cultural traditions see it as important to their lives. In Asia, support for democracy remains quite strong in Japan, Korea, and Taiwan, and at least nominally in Thailand and Indonesia. But the most astonishing evidence for universal values comes from Africa. Uh, and I think the former executive director of the Afrobarometer, Jima Bwadi, is here with us. Thank you, Jima, for your, all your work and sharing of the data. <clears throat> Where the Afrobarometer finds that two-thirds of Africans across 36 countries continue to believe that democracy is preferable to any other form of government. And at least two-thirds of Africans reject each of the principal authoritarian alternatives, one-man rule, one-party rule, military rule. However, some African countries have seen dramatic declines in democratic support, especially South Africa where support for democracy has declined in the past seven years by 21 percentage points, down to 43%. South Africa has one of the highest percentages in Africa who say it is more important to have a government that can get things done than one that is politically accountable. Why? Because three decades after the end of apartheid, its people do not see their elected government getting things done. The youth unemployment rate in South Africa is one of the worst in the world, 61%. A third of South Africans are without jobs. Not surprisingly, satisfaction with the way democracy is working in South Africa has declined by 23 points to just 25%. What is brewing in South Africa is explosive discontent not simply with the disheartening shortfalls in employment, economic growth, and social services, but with rampant co corruption on the part of the ruling party that has faced no serious electoral challenge in its nearly three decades of rule. If South Africa slides toward a liberal populism grounded in racial resentment, as could happen in the coming elections next May, it will be tragic not only for the country, but for the continent. The trends in public opinion in Latin America are also troubling. Across the region, support for democracy has declined from 65% in 2010 to 48% today and to just 35% in Mexico. And there is a disturbing correlation with age. The younger the age group in Latin America, the lower the support for democracy. Only 43% of Latin Americans, 25 or younger, support democracy. And satisfaction with the way democracy is working has plunged to abysmal levels. In formerly democratic countries, 22% in Bolivia, 17% in Colombia, just 8% in Peru, which with seven presidents in the last chaotic eight years shows, to quote a Journal of Democracy article, democracies can also perish from power dilution. In only two Latin American countries are a majority satisfied with democracy. Uruguay, the country's most democratic country, and El Salvador, 
where the power-grabbing authoritarian president, Nayib Bukele, is wildly popular for his brutal crackdown on ruthless criminal gangs. Satisfaction with democracy in the region has fallen from 45% in 2009 to 28% today. And again, protracted performance, poor performance, is heavily to blame. Voters in Latin America have become alarmed by high levels of crime and violence. And throughout the region, an economic bubble has burst. During the first 14 years of this century, Latin America rode a commodities boom that decreased poverty from 27 to 12% and diminished the region's extreme levels of inequality. Higher prices for exports, like oil, metals, and foodstuffs, brought surging government revenues, more social spending, rising wages, and expanding employment. That's gone. Uh, the boom which went, went bust was too focused on commodity exports and too dependent on demand from a single country, of course, China. As Lipset explained in his seminal work, there is an intricate relationship between legitimacy and regime performance. Belief in the legitimacy of democracy may be shaped by distinctive cultural traditions and historical developments, but it is also driven by economic development and the performance of present versus past regimes. In newer democracies, legitimacy depends on the system's performance in resolving political problems and delivering what people want from government. A long record of effective performance builds a reservoir of legitimacy, Marty often said, that can sustain democracy in times of crisis. But he added, I quote, even in legitimate systems, a breakdown of effectiveness repeatedly or over a long period will endanger its stability. So, Here's how I would phrase it. The most, the most dangerous democratic illusion is the vanity of permanence. The notion that because democracy has become deeply legitimized through decades of effective performance, its stability can never be reversed. A major reason why democracy has been eroding in this century is that its economic and political performance has often been poor. Newer democracies like Tunisia may have less time to show that they can govern effectively. When failure to deliver is accompanied by ineptitude, fragmentation, opportunism, and corruption among the politicians and their shallow par parties, uh, I think Dan Brumberg is in this room and he's written about this, public patience is further diminished. That heavily explains Tunisian's readiness in 2019 to elect and then applaud an anti-political authoritarian strongman. To avert a downward spiral in South Africa, to avoid giving military officers in more countries a pretext to seize power, to preempt authoritarian politicians like Kais Saeed in Tunisia, Nayib Bukele in El Salvador, and Patrice Talon in Benin from eviscerating constitutional norms Democracy must generate some measure of prosperity, security, and opportunity while containing corruption, crime, and the abuse of power. So now on to power at the global level. Another major reason why freedom and democracy have been retreating since 2006 is the shifting balance of global power and prestige. During the third wave, U.S. and European pressure, diplomatic engagement and support often tip the balance toward a successful transition or away from democratic demise. But now the U.S., EU, influential uh, individual European democracies are much less likely to exert the necessary pressure. Not simply the threat of sanctions, but even diplomatic pressure and forthright statements of principle. Look how long it took us to even declare that there was the most obvious of coups in Niger, and therefore to reverse democratic backsliding or even acknowledge that it is happening. This reluctance enabled Viktor Orban to dismantle Hungarian democracy before he had to face any material consequences. It has given President Alexander Vucic room to maneuver Serbia 
back to competitive authoritarianism while thinking it would not affect Serbia's bid for EU accession. And it has enabled Bukele to literally get away with murder in El Salvador. Carefully choreographed diplomatic pr pressure can still work to defend democracy, as was demonstrated by the successful efforts of the Biden administration to press Brazilian military leaders and politicians to respect the results of the 2022 elections. But we need more of this. The essential work of financial and technical aid to democratic organizations, parties, governing institutions, movements, medias, and electoral processes goes on, partly in thanks to the National Endowment for Democracy. But it does not benefit from the synergy with diplomatic support and pressure and the increased scale of support that the times demand. The retreat from democracy promotion stemming from the unsuccessful U.S. state building efforts in Iraq, the 2008 financial crisis, the polarizing effects of social media and various stresses of globalization reflects a broader erosion of national self-confidence and resolve in the established democracies. These are important, if intangible, dimensions of global power. And then there is the sharp power of the world's most powerful autocracies, principally China and Russia, which have been working to undermine and subvert democracy by covert means. Uh, or as the former Australian Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull put it, in the second best explanation of sharp power after everything that Chris Walker has written, activities that are covert, coercive, and corrupting activities to penetrate, sway, and propagandize democratic societies and institutions. These efforts have so far borne mixed results. Uh, democracies have become more aware of them. They're beginning to take action to counter them. But even very wealthy democracies, not least the United States, I think we should say Canada as well, remain vulnerable to Chinese, Russian, Iranian, Gulf state, and other covert authoritarian influence efforts we still have an enormous amount of work to do to defend the integrity and autonomy of our universities, our research enterprises, and our think tanks, our high technology innovations, our private enterprises, our newspapers, broadcast, and social media, our subnational governments, our political parties, our community organizations, and other civic institutions from covert efforts to bend them to the purposes of powerful authoritarian governments. The battle for independent critical media and open flows of information is especially important because authoritarian efforts, principally by China and Russia, to distort news and narratives and to pump false and democratically demoralizing content into social media streams and public conversations can shift public opinion and sour public support for democracy and democracy promotion. And then there is a hard power of military might, which Putin's Russia has used first to gobble up parts of Georgia and now to try to obliterate Ukraine's democracy and sovereignty. A Russian victory in Ukraine would embolden it to attack other democratic parts of the former Soviet Union. Meanwhile, China, with the world's most rapidly expanding military, in fact, the most rapidly expanding military since World War II, is using its growing naval and air forces to try to establish near total control of the South China Sea and to pressure Taiwan into giving up its democracy and unifying with Beijing. Should China succeed in these efforts, the prospects for freedom in Asia would be greatly diminished and countries around the world might well con conclude that the future belongs to power maximizing autocracies, not constitutional democracies. This is why the defense of Ukraine and Taiwan and of other endangered democracies in Eastern Europe and East, East Asia are part of one and the same cause. And although it is a more complex case, I believe the same is true for the existence of the state of Israel, the only democracy in the Middle East. 
If we shrink from defending Israel's right to exist democratically as a Jewish state, we not only erase a historic and legitimate claim to nationhood, but we legitimate and reward authoritarian actors who use violence to achieve their aims. This is not a judgment about what the borders of that state should be if peace could be negotiated with the Palestinians. It is a minimum assertion. We cannot allow a democracy to be erased from the map by aggression, terror, and intimidation. The cause of freedom in the world is indivisible. Democracy cannot be secure anywhere in the world when it faces powerful dictatorships that deny its legitimacy, repress the rights of their people, censor free flows of information, and propagate disinformation and untruth. Every democratic loss or failure has potential diffusion and demonstration effects. And every birth or defense of democracy becomes a source of hope, instruction, and inspiration for others. The realists say, let's live and let live with these dictatorships. And certainly, we must do everything possible to avoid war. But deeply repressive autocracies cannot live in benign coexistence with liberal democracies because they face a fundamental legitimacy dilemma. Since they do not establish and renew their mandate to rule organically through the free competition of parties, candidates, and ideas, they are deeply vulnerable to a crisis of legitimacy, to the slow rotting creep of cynicism and detachment experienced by the Soviet Union, and hence to sudden eruptions of discontent, disgust, and even sudden death. This is the great fear that haunts dis dictatorships. Thank you, Mary, for helping us understand it. It is why they feel so threatened by free flows of information, independent research, critical debate, and alternative ideas in education and the arts. It is why they must dominate the realms of information and ideas, and why, if they cannot instill severe, sincere devotion to the rulers, they must at least generate fear, hatred, and resignation. Fear of the other, of some readily demonized minority, the Roma, the Jews, the Muslims, the immigrants, the LGBTQ community, the other in whatever form is indispensable to autocrats. If all they have to offer is a record of economic performance, that can be fleeting. When they cease to produce improvements in people's lives, people ask, what have you done for us lately? And then people will no longer concede to the bargain, okay, we'll give up our freedom in exchange for development. If you are the Ayatollahs in Iran, Putin in Russia, or the inheritors of bankrupt autocracies in North Korea, Burma, Venezuela, and Venezuela. And now, as growth fades and capital seeks to flee, if you are Xi Jinping, you must wield the indispensable weapon of dictatorship, fear. Fear of uncertainty, fear of dangerous minorities from within, fear of enemies without. With fear goes aggressive, xenophobic nationalism. If you cannot offer your people material progress and individual dignity, you urge them to draw hope and validation from the greatness of the national project, its triumph over enemies. You promote glorious nationalist goals, the reunification of the motherland, the conquest of supposedly lost territory, it is an old and ugly story, the lesson of countless needless wars. It is this fundamental and ancient truth that we confront today in the most important challenges to world peace. Russia's brutal and unprovoked wars against U Ukraine, the Hamas mass murder of innocent Israelis, a war of nihilistic anti-Semitic rage by a criminal organization masquerading as a state the backing that Iran's primeval theocratic dictatorship offers to Hamas and other terrorist proxies. If you are Xi Jinping sitting atop 
a shrinking po population, a stalling economy, a bullied and subjugated business class, and your ideology of control and your ambition from historical greatness are at stake, you wage a campaign of cyber, political, economic, and incremental military aggression against Taiwan with the goal of eventually swallowing it. Power still matters. And that includes the most basic and element, tragic as it is, uh, element of power, the ability to mobilize and repel violence. Just as it seeks to reshape borders, military power shapes expectations. That is captured by what international theorists call the bandwagon effect, and by the German term, which Marty also loved, zeitgeist, the spirit of the times. If democracies are weak and irresolute and then militarily defeated, or if they cower and prevaricate in the face of authoritarian aggression, it will not just be the defeated democracies we lose. Many other states and societies will throw in their lot with the new authoritarian juggernaut or model themselves after it as the embodiment of strength and success. In a world without rules, power rules, and people lined up behind the powerful. So this is the most important thing we can say tonight. Democracy cannot be weak. It cannot afford to lose on the battlefield. This is why it remains so vital for the future of freedom globally that Ukraine win the war, regain its territory, and defeat Russia's aggression. It is why Hamas must be defeated and disabled as a terrorist organization while doing everything possible to preserve the lives, the rights, and the dignity of innocent Palestinians and their legitimate claim to a state of their own. And it is why liberal democracies must clearly signal their intent to help Taiwan defend itself. Neither can democracy afford to lose at the negotiating table or in the UN General Assembly or on the debate stage or in the race to develop new technologies, or in the classrooms, and most of all the social media platforms that are shaping what people think and believe. To prevail, democracies cannot afford to be divided, and Democrats, and politics, uh, Democrats in politics and civil society must not fail to unite. The news from this global struggle, this is the part you were asking for, uh, is not all bad. Democracy's adversaries are deeply anxious. Their populations are aging and even shrinking. And their economies are in deep trouble. They are not, or in the case of China, are no longer models of success. Democrats of various parties, ideologies, nationalities, and cultures have a positive agenda to offer. The opportunity to live in dignity, truth, and the limitless creative possibilities of human freedom, the chance to protect freedom, correct governance failures, and improve societies through the institutional formula unique to democracy, free and fair competition, inclusive participation, open flows of information, and a rule of law. Dictatorships offer only the grim, degrading bargain. Give up your freedom, and we will give you order, and maybe for a time, prosperity. Dictators know their people do not want or will not indefinitely accept that bargain. The people of, du of Burma do not want that bargain. It is why Myanmar's repressive military is at war against its own people, a war it is losing. The people of, do, of Iran do not want that bargain. It is why 14 months after the 22-year-old Masa Amin was brutally beaten to death by the Ayatollah's morality police, even after, and the numbers I'm sure are higher now, over 500 Iranians have died and 20,000 have been arrested in protests, civil resistance continues. And why the Nobel Peace Prize Committee awarded Narges Mohammadi its prize this year for her extraordinary courage and defiance in the struggle 
for freedom in Iran. The people of Venezuela do not want that bargain. It is why seven million of them have fled the country in the last eight years. The people of Africa do not want that bargain. It is why even with all the challenges and disappointments of multi-party politics, three quarters of Africans say they want to choose the leaders of their country through regular, open, and honest elections. And most certainly, the people of Ukraine do not want that bargain, and thus are enduring enormous sacrifices to defend their democracy against Russian aggression. Power and legitimacy are two sides of the same story that determines who rules. The more an actor can mobilize power, the less it needs legitimacy, and vice versa. <clears throat> but legitimacy is a form of power. The great Czech Democrat Václav Havel understood that to deny a regime legitimacy, to live in truth and refuse it cooperation, is a form of power, the power of the powerless. Exerting the power of the powerless helped to pave the way for the fall of dictatorships in the 1980s and 90s. At that time, power and legitimacy were converging to support movements for freedom around the world. Now we are losing ground to aggressive autocracies and to autocrats in democratic clothing. While powerful autocracies have waged muscular, technologically adroit assaults on democracy, we have retreated from the ideological struggle. It is not the people of Burma, Belarus, or Venezuela who have retreated, not the people of Thailand who had a democratic election victory robbed from them by a cynical alliance of the military, the power elite, and party opportunists, not the brave journalists of Russia and Belarus carrying on the struggle to report and publish the truth in exile, not the leader of Tunisia's Muslim Democratic Party, Rashid Ghanoushi, now in his eight months as a political prisoner for the crime of insisting that President Kai Saeed restore democracy to Tunisia. Not the Democratic newspaper publisher, Jimmy Lai, who returned to Hong Kong several years ago, already past age 70 and an extremely wealthy man, facing the prospect of indefinite imprisonment, but unwilling to abandon his fellow journalists and the cause of freedom in Hong Kong. Not Svetlana Tikhanouskaya, uh, who, when her husband was arrested for challenging the Belarusian dictator, Alexander Lukashenko, in the 2020 presidential election, stepped in to lead that campaign, and who now carries on the struggle for democracy from exile. Thank you for that. It is not Alexei Navalny or Vladimir Karamurza who returned to Russia facing nearly certain imprisonment to defy and resist Putin's decadent dictatorship, and it is most certainly not Nargis Mohammadi. It is not they who retreated from the struggle, but the supposedly wealthy and resourceful democracies. We are not waging the ideological struggle, the normative struggle, the informational struggle for democracy, and for freedom with the energy, resources, conviction, coordination, and technological ingenuity of which we are capable and which the times demand. We must get serious again about teaching and diffusing the values, experiences, requirements, and institutional designs of democracy. And we must do so on a scale with the scope and ease of access in many different languages that is required. We must get more serious about countering authoritarian disinformation and influence efforts, exposing their lies and self-serving purposes. We must provide democratic movements and publications with the technology and resources to report the news, educate for democracy, and counter authoritarian propaganda on a much larger scale. If we want to restore global democratic momentum, we must demonstrate that democracy with freedom and a rule of law is a morally and practically superior form of government. It is not hard to make this case because it is true, but it requires resources, imagination, and renewed confidence 
both in the moral imperative of this cause and in its enduring promise. In accepting the NED Democracy Award just last month at an amazing event here in town, on behalf of all of those imprisoned or killed in the struggle for democracy in 2023, Venerable Golag Jigme, a Tibetan monk, human rights activist, activist, filmmaker, and former political prisoner in China, offered these eloquent words, and I leave you with them. Autocrats resist the simple fact that the desire for freedom is inherent in human nature. It can never be extinguished, not through propaganda, not through censorship, certainly not through brute force. Because of this, he said, and I agree, I know freedom will win, autocrats will fail, and we must never give up. Never given up, and she has to get to another event. So let's give her a bit of time to reflect. So first of all, Larry, thank you for a truly magnificent lecture. Uh, really captured the zeitgeist, I would say. And we have um, just a few minutes, but we're so delighted to have with us President-elect Svetlana Tikhonovskaya for a conversation. And I'd like to get right into it, if I could, maybe using some of the um, ideas and insights that Larry shared during his lecture, he spoke of legitimacy and he makes the point that authoritarian regimes by their nature lack the popular consent that would give them legitimacy. And in Belarus's 2020 elections, how would you describe the effect this had on the authorities in Minsk after those elections? So uh, first of all, uh, you know, every word uh, in your lecture uh, Professor Diamond resonate in me because I really, you know, we are going through the processes you uh, described. And actually, the recent people don't want that this bargain anymore. Two, for many decades, you know, we gave up our freedom in exchange of uh, order and, you know, stability. And back in 2020, the recent people said enough to this. And uh, maybe for the first time for almost three decades, new candidates like appeared, uh, you know, instead of Lukashenko and people supported these people. And immediately these people who became threat to Lukashenko's regime uh, were, uh, were detained. So this is how dictators, you know, are fighting with, with the uh, popular people in, uh, in Belarus. And, uh, also, you know, I'm just, I, I had uh, wrote so many hooks, you know, from, from your lecture. All the person people wanted back in 2020 is free and fair elections. It wasn't like a revolution against like personal Lukashenko dictator. We just wanted to, uh, uh, Lukashenko's regime to show uh, real results of the elections. And uh, when, and also we, uh, democratic forces should unite. It's also your, uh, your message. And back in 2020, Belarus and people united around this goal. It wasn't a person or personality around which people united. It was free and fair elections. And uh, of course, we also use technologies to prove uh, that Lukashenko lost elections 2020. You know, we managed to hold uh, alternative uh, counting of the votes and people were really involved in this process and we have proofs that Lukashenko lost elections and uh, you know and we given the knowing the results uh, you know Lukashenko didn't want to uh, give up you know he unleashed the unprecedented and terror against Belarus and people who went to the streets to peacefully uh, protect their votes and their voices and uh, since then for 3 years already uh, repressions are continuing in our country every day till now. 
15, 20 Belarusians are being detained for their anti-regime or uh, anti-war position in, uh, in our country. But uh, Belarusian people know that Lukashenko is not legitimate, that he lost legitimacy back in 2020, and uh, uh, our democratic partners, democratic allies, know about this as well. And uh, back in 2020, they declared clearly, Lukashenko is illegitimate, and we are, uh, and we are supporting democratic forces of Belarus, united democratic forces, and since then, uh, you know, it's difficult to fight with dictators, actually, because uh, dictators don't respect uh, international uh, rules, you know, and uh, uh, democracy maybe uh, not have, like, very effective tools to fight with uh, dictators, but, you know, for three years, Belarus and people are not giving up uh, our democratic allies uh, standing with us, and for sure, uh, maybe we... Uh, you know, democracy is lack of decisiveness, you know, time to time. And uh, maybe a reaction of uh, the Western countries was rather slow back in 2020 to show its teeth. But still, you know, we are keeping united, we are keeping strong, and we are, uh, you know, continuing our fight. And one of the other points that Larry made was the um, role and posture of the better resource democracies around the world and how they affect the balance of power and perception of non-democracies. What would you say, uh, Madam President-elect, have been the most important contributions that the community of democratic states have made to the cause um, of democracy in, in Belarus? You know, I think that protests in our country wouldn't be possible without a strong civil society. And thanks to uh, our democratic partners, thanks to uh, National Endowment for Democracy that started to work with Belarusian society starting from 1990s, thanks to embassies like Canadian uh, embassy that contributed into educational process of Belarus, step by step Belarusian uh, civil society started to be initiative, started to learn how to self to be self organized. You know, and step by step, you know, civil society was was growing and was uh, strengthening. And uh, so, uh, uh, you know, and, and, and this helped uh, our protests back in 2020. It helped uh, civil society to survive uh, in exile because in 2020, all the NGOs in our country were ruined. Free media was ruined, but people, you know, having this experience and having support of our partners, uh, they managed to uh, renew their activity in exile and work from, from exile. Uh, also, we, uh, as democratic forces, we are building uh, democratic institutions. Yes, in exile at the moment, because the level of repressions in our country doesn't allow uh, to do it in, uh, in the country. But we have co uh, United Transitional Cabinet as proto-government. We have Coordination Council as proto-parliament. You rightly said that democracy is rather difficult to, 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 to live in. Uh, dictatorship is, is much more easier. You know, you just have to obey the rules, just shut up and, 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 uh, and be slaves, you know. But uh, in democracy, you have to study how to debate, not to quarrel, not to fight, but to debate, to look for consensus. It's rather difficult, but and we have to study do this. And that's why we are building these institutions already now, because for sure, so, sooner or later, we will be able to dismantle this regime and we will have rather short periods of time, we we'll call, we'll call it transition period, when we'll have to, uh, uh, like to take these uh, uh, democratic institutions you know, from exile and put it into, in, in, into inside Belarus. Also, we are uh, educating Belarusian people what democracy is, why it's so valuable, why, why we have to defend it, defend it and to fight, fight actually for it. It's also a like difficult process. And, uh, you know, the support of uh, democratic countries is, is so important. We need to show to the Russian people alternative to uh, Russian world, to Ruski Mir. You know, we, uh, with the help of our democratic allies, we want to show perspectives of development for, uh, for Belarusian people. Uh, and um, uh, so, so uh, that's why we are asking our uh, partners to, on the one hand, to punish the regime, to impose 
sanctions on the regime for their crimes, to isolate regime politically, uh, and uh, to bring uh, those who committed crimes inside Belarus to accountability. On the other hand, help our free media, help our uh, like cultural initiatives, because uh, um, saving national identity is the like best antidote to Ruski Mir. Help our NGOs not just to survive, you know, but to, to, to develop and to win this fight. So we need actually solidarity and practi practical uh, assistance to, to, our, uh, to our movement. And uh, yeah, I, I told already about the commitment to the future that you will be our partners, uh, not only now in this fight, but also into the future. We will have turbulence time after dismantling the regime, we'll have rather poor economic situation and we will need investment, you know, just we need support now and we'll need support, uh, uh, support in the future. And, uh, you know, the democratic powerful countries, you know, they have to help those who are in the fight for democratic changes. Because we actually, such countries as Belarus, as Ukraine in our region, are at the front line of fighting uh, against dictatorship, you know, and uh, it's uh, it's uh, like moral obligation of every country to support to support us because the uh, dictatorship is like cancer. You no, know, until it cuts to the last cell, it will develop and it will knock to each your doors. So stop it, stop uh, stop dictatorship now. No, it, it not to be like uh, spill over spill over the regions and and uh, continents. So maybe I'll try to have you and Larry uh, answer a question. I know we don't have too much time, but this notion of democratic unity, it applies both within countries that are taking on a repressive regime, but I think it's also the case in Belarus that in a sense you have been fighting multiple dictatorships. So you have the one in Minsk, you have the one in Moscow, and one could argue that um, maybe Beijing and some others are also helping in that partnership um, how would you make the case to people who have the good fortune to live in open societies of how much more unity and focus we, we need to, to meet this challenge? And Larry, maybe I'll have you say a word on that as well. Uh, you're right to say that we are fighting two dictatorships simultaneously, but this is our destiny, actually. But I want to say that dictators are learning from each other very fast. You know, they use uh, the same tools, you know, and uh, they uh, like intensify each other. And in this very moment, democracy has to show its teeth. Democracy has to show that you have instruments and you have decisiveness and will to fight with dictatorship. Because when uh, dictators, you know, they read red line, cross red line, and there is no answer from democratic world, okay, we will. Uh, cross the next red line. And this uh, undecisiveness of a democratic world is percepted as weakness from, from dictators. And uh, I think that in, in this like critical, actually, historical time for, for our region, at least, and for other countries that you mentioned, uh, it's very important for democratic powerful countries to show that democracy deserves to fight for, that you really can't, can't defend uh, democratic values. And those people who are fighting, you know, for democracy, they, they deserve support as well. So it encourages people, you know, to continue their fight because you show uh, your, your, you know, that values matters. Well, um, let me say that unity is important both within countries and across countries. Within countries, I think almost every instance, certainly all three color revolutions and four, if you count what I consider to be the first one in the Philippines in February of 1986, where um, Cory Aquino, if I may say so, uh, played a very similar role to the one that you were forced to step into playing, Madam President-elect. She had the benefit of a different historical era and um, uh, a different balance of power, particularly in the Philippines. 
And so when Ferdinand Marcos did in the Philippines, what Lukashenko did in Belarus, we had the power, we had the resolve, and I really want to underscore the word, we had the alliances to force him out. We had the leverage. Uh, unfortunately, we lacked that or failed to mobilize it in the case of Belarus. But you would not have gotten to the point you did of winning the esteem internationally uh, and winning the election, at least in terms of the reality, without unifying the opposition in the extraordinary way uh, that you and your colleagues did. Uh, and uh, the authoritarian ruling party in, in Poland would not have been defeated uh, if the democratic parties with very different ideological orientations didn't come together in common purpose and in clear coalition. And uh, Democrats would not have gotten close in Turkey where I actually believe that the Democrats may have won um, because I think there was very significant electoral fraud in the Turkish presidential election and, and elsewhere without this. But where they win, they, it's, it's partly because they unify. And if they fail to unify, they almost always lose. A very important lesson for democratic forces facing uh, uh, you know, uh, an electoral threat uh, from uh, an authoritarian ruling party or uh, an authoritarian challenger. And then globally, uh, you know, the balance, I repeat, the balance of power has shifted dramatically. We do not have the luxury of division among the world's democracies. I still honestly cling to the optimism you asked for. Um, I'm very optimistic. I think that the autocracies are enter entering a period of deep, if not existential, crisis. But if the democracies don't forge a common strategy and really hone their common leverage uh, and resources to face the still very considerable uh, resources and propaganda capacity of Russia, China, Iran, and so on, and some fellow travelers among other states, they're probably not going to succeed. So unity is condition number one for me. And I know we're coming to the end of our time, so maybe one last question, if, uh, if I may. Larry emphasized the uh, ideological battle that's out there to understand uh, what the dictatorships are seeking to achieve. What might you say to um, everyone who's watching about how serious this ideological challenge and competition is right now? In Belarus? In Belarus and perhaps in the wider world. Uh, <laughs> you know, of course, I, I, I can speak on, 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 uh, on behalf of Belarusian people. You know, uh, in our country, uh, Lukashenko, for example, doesn't have any ideology. You know, he built his, uh, his uh, um, uh, dictatorship you know, uh, around his personality, without any ideology, he always he always like said, you know, uh, I give you, uh, I give you order. Uh, I there is no war in our country. I protect you from all the neighbors who want to invade us. This is his rhetoric. Uh, but uh, you know, he 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 didn't. He have never promoted any values. So, uh, and people, you know, people. He. You know, he's controlling people only through the feeling of fear. He's blackmailing people, you know, he's, uh, he's detaining relatives of uh, uh, people who are opposing, for example, now who, who, are, who are in exile. And uh, he's uh, keeping, he's torturing people in jails. And this is how he can influence, you know, the uh, behavior of people. For example, our uh, uprising, our revolution inside Belarus, it went underground because people understand that for Putin like, uh, in, on Instagram, or commenting something, or even speaking Belarusian language, or donating to Ukrainian army, you can be detained for 10, 15, or even 20 years in jail. So uh, uh, this is why Lukashenko doesn't have anything to propose to uh, to people of Belarus. And again, I, I'm returning to uh, to alternative we are building, you know, to proposing Belarusian people that we want to build. Uh, a country where every person is important.
this is uh, people who will serve to, to uh, government should serve people, but not vice versa. Uh, and we, we need to give like clear perspectives for those things. Well, I think that's such a clear vision uh, for us to end on. I'll just say that whenever I and my colleagues have the opportunity to hear you and your colleagues speak, we're always inspired. And I think it's important for these audiences to hear your, um, your words and your thoughts and your vision to help us keep clear-minded. And Larry, uh, thank you again so much for just a phenomenal speech that we should uh, all pay very close attention to. Thank so thank you again, Larry Diamond, and thank you, President-elect Tikhonovskaya. Thank you.